Thank you so much for attending this session presented by the Oli Foundation and sponsored by Takeda. Uh, partnering with patients, an ace up your sleeve. Now, I am Kelly Tappenden. I'm currently president of the Ole Board of, of, uh, of Trustees. Thank you. I was thinking directors. <laughs> uh, and, and it's my real honor to start off today. Uh, I want to tell you that it's a special year for Oli. We are having our 40th anniversary uh, this year. And so we want to, yes, thank you. We want to look back at 40 years, but also really focus on the next 40 years, because that's certainly where all of us are, are thinking right now, what we can do to really try and provide value. So as, as I said, the Oli Foundation was formed in 1983. So you'll recognize that that wasn't long after PN was first infused into those beagle puppies and, and the first few patients. It was formed by Dr. Lynn Howard and Clarence Oldenburg. Now, for those of you who don't know who he was, he was a patient of, of Dr. Howard's who was on PN. Uh, and Oldenburg, his nickname was Oli. Uh, and so that's where the name for the Oli Foundation came for. They, this was a great community, as it still is, but these patients, Joan was just telling me, would want to get together. They had their first gathering the following year, and 40 people were in attendance. It was like a backyard barbecue, I'm told. Uh, and a lot web, website was launched in 97. Now, in 99... Joan became the executive director. There were 3,000 members at the time. So really very impressive for, for this specialized niche therapy. But by 2010, there were 10,000 members. So only 23 years, or 13 years ago. This year, there's over 27,000 members. Okay, so this is a huge community that really is feeling an important need for these patients. Um, and and we're really glad to be able to spend time here with you. Now, one of the things we did last year was talk about some of the gaps and, and some of the needs that we had within this community for these patients and as caregivers and providers. And it was recognized that there's a lot of change in technology, right? We know that tubes are changing. There's always changes in formulations. Best practices are changing, new medications. So that was something that we, we need to be keeping our eye on. Um, and then also supply chain. Like so many other things, the supply chain issue has, has impacted home parenteral and enteral nutrition, right? It's impacted these patients in a big way. We know that, that shortages uh, have been a problem for, for decades, but it's really exceeded beyond that, and that's something that requires a lot a lot of oversight and advice and advocacy for and so Oli has has paid attention to that the third thing that we really felt that there was a gap for is all of you who are in the room and making sure that as those of us who are retiring moving on to other things um, leave the field that we have professionals and specialists coming up behind us who can provide the care to these patients particularly with physicians, right, who are educated and trained in nutrition support. So that's certainly something that we need to emphasize too. But you know, the board has really tried to look, look at these things and we wanna move forward. Those are the gaps, but we wanna move forward on that. So we have these pillars of advocacy, education, innovation, community. Of course, that's a big one for Oli, right? Uh, and, we really want to try and make sure that we focus on these areas. That's what we're gonna to do today. We're, you're gonna hear from a variety of individuals who can speak to some of these important um, issues and what it is that we think is important in the field and where we want to go. So you'll see several speakers coming up. We'll be introducing um, them as, as they, they come. So every person will introduce introduce the previous one. I am very, or the next one, I am very pleased to introduce Beth Gore. Uh, and she will, she will be sharing with us what it is like to be our new executive uh, director who's collaborating with Joan this year and, and will be, be um, 
taking over completely when Joan retires this summer. Um, she's also a parent though. She uh, has, has a child who is receiving uh, nutrition support. And so she has a, a, a great focus for us. She was the previous president of the Board of Trustees. So her, her focus is, is and, and perspective is really, really important. Welcome back. Thanks everybody, but first a, th a big thanks to Kelly. Kelly is our current president, but she's also Aspen's Champion Award today. So after this is over, yes. We, we invite everybody immediately after this to go to the Grand Ballroom and come to the opening kickoff of Aspen. And then also, if you don't get a chance to ask your questions today or talk to us, please come by our booth at 221. We're going to be in the exhibit hall. So we would love to talk to each and every one of you, especially if you have questions. So thank you, Kelly. Um, so I was on a boat one day, I live in Tampa, and so we were, it was one of those just perfect days. It wasn't hot, it wasn't cold, the wind blowing in our hair. My son, Manny, was hooked up to TPN at the time. You could probably tell where this is going, right? No. We, uh, we, it was just, the, it was just great. Like my other children, there's five other children. My husband had taken them off to swim. We were sitting on the boat. Yes, if you're doing the math, that's six children. Um, uh, yes, I'm not a saint nor crazy, well, I'm one of those, but you'll pick later which one that is, right? So all of a sudden I get a phone call from Manny's GI that says, hey, we need some routine labs. And it wasn't even her, it was her office, right? And I said, well, that's great. Um, we let you know we're out of town for a couple of days, so we're gonna do that two days late. Um, and they were like, no, it has to be today because that's the office policy. I'm like, well, we're across the state on vacation. Like, I'm literally sitting here on a boat with sun, sun on my shoulders and sand on my toes. Um, can, we, can we delay that? No, policy is that you have to have this done today. There was no question of labs. It wasn't like he had had some bad labs or something, in case just what you're wondering. So we go, we go to the condo, and this nurse who's never seen us before says that he's got to draw the labs. And I'm like, well, we draw the labs, author. We've been doing this for many years. We are authorized to do that. Nope, our policy over on this side of the state is that we have to draw it. I'm like, okay. So he does what he's going to do. And long story short, by the end, he goes, hey, this is a little tight. I'm like, no, that's how his line feels. And they said, I've got a technique. And I'm like, please don't <sighs> pop. Ex fractures, he's bleeding everywhere. Now this man is like 60 something years old and I think he's gonna have a heart attack because he is scared to death. So I am now, my son is screaming, you broke my line, you broke my line. And he knows what that means. He knows because this isn't his first line. Fracture, nine times it had broken at a nurse's hand, never at ours. Um, so he is freaking out. This man is, I'm like, please sit down so you don't pass out, we'll got this. It took us hours, we had to get together because Manny's hypoglycemia, like now all of a sudden, like I still have on my bathing suit. And we get in the car, I put on a cover up. We get in the car, <laughs> detail. Uh, we get in the car, we rush him over there. Um, they, his hypoglycemia is so severe that they have to get an IV in. His chart says that he's allergic to CHG. No, at our hospital it has to be done anyway. I mean like, do you hear a pattern coming up here? So every single time we're falling through the cracks of these different patterns because that's the way this is supposed to be done. He develops this ridiculous allergy on his arm. They finally get the labs. By the way, they were normal. Um, they, uh, they have to admit us because the IV team isn't there. We're there the next day he gets an infection. We are there for a week and a half. Okay, so who failed? Where's the failure of this? Nowhere. Nobody failed. No one person. It's a systemic issue. That's the problem. One decision led to another, which led to another. No human said, I'm going to break your line today. I'm going to give you an infection today. I'm going to make sure you don't have what you need. But it's a series of episodic events that caused um, harm that day. So I come to the world from patient safety perspective. As Kelly just mentioned, I'm the new executive director for the Ole Foundation, which is some really big shoes to fill, as you can imagine. 
Um, but I come from a patient safety world, and let's call this what this is. Nutrition support is a patient safety issue. We don't call it that, but we need to. And if you can see up in that little corner over there, if you can read that, it says advancement in patient safety requires an overarching shift from reactive piecemeal interventions to a total systems approach. And if you you probably can't, but you read those eight, eight things down there, it talks about like the path forward of how to do this. This isn't, we're not the first group to have this issue with the need to do a systemic change. ECRI, which doesn't stand for anything, it used to, so ECRI is just a name if you don't know this, three, uh, about three weeks ago came out with their top safety concerns for 2023. Um, number six is what I'd like to highlight. Consequences of poor coordination for patients with complex medical conditions. This is on their top 10 list from three weeks ago um, that they are calling this out as a top patient safety in the country right now. If you look at them, um, six of them actually apply to only patients. Um, there are several of their impact on clinicians expected to work outside their cope, <laughs> scope of practice and competencies. This is that call to action that just says we have got to get more people in the pipeline that does what they're supposed to be doing and knows what they're doing. And we need to be able to plug patients into that. And we could go down this whole list, but what I'm saying is this is a patient safety issue. Let's call it what it is. So I use an analogy of rocks. Now, I can tell you, I actually tried to get a wheelbarrow of rocks here today. That's harder to do in Vegas than you would think. So instead I wore this, I know it's um, giraffes, but pretend that these are rocks. So use your imagination, okay? So that's what it feels like from a patient perspective to me, is that we, have a, we, we collect a rock, and then we collect another rock, and then we collect another rock. And each one, we're not sure what to do with it and how to collect it. And we're not given a wheelbarrow at first. We're just said, oh, here, do this task. Episodic, series of episodic events. And when we leave the hospital, it's different. So for example, my dad was in the hospital years ago. He had a heart issue. He was on TPN for a few weeks. Looking back, I knew that. I didn't know that at the time. You know why? Because he was in ICU, unconscious, and the nurses and the doctors were taking care of everything from beginning to end. I didn't need to know. He didn't leave the hospital with a, any kind of devices. He didn't go home on this. How much does the family really need to know about parental nutrition at that point? Next to nothing. By comparison, my mother-in-law went home with a port, not for parental nutrition, but she went home for a port. Now, how much does she need to know to keep her safe at home? Very little. In fact, she didn't have one alcohol wipe. She didn't have one Huber needle. She didn't have one flush at home because everything was going to be done at the hospital, back at the clinic, right? So what does she need to know? Signs and symptoms of infection, who to call, when, when things go wrong, but still very little. By comparison, I get sent home with um, a child on parental nutrition, and they say, good luck with that. And I have to do everything, right? And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying there's a big misconnect here. There's a huge misconnect from the time, like, you, you, you guys knew that I'm going home on this. So everything from the device, everything from the signs and symptoms, we get home. And what I find is that everybody says, not me. It's not my job. So I asked, who's going to teach me about this? Oh, the next person will, the next person, the next person will. I get home, and they say, oh, the people at the hospital should have done that. So it's about ownership. And here's what it comes down to is, by the end, the safety issue is, who owns these rocks? Who owns these? Just like my story about the boat. Who, who owned all those pieces? I do. And that's not fair to patients to put things on us without giving us the support and giving us the training and giving us the guidelines and giving us everything we need in order to do that safely. And then heaven forbid we say, I don't understand, oh, you're not compliant. Now, I know patients are not compliant too. I get that, right? But we still have to, how do you work? We got to work together. That's the point. And I think that we need to trigger, where it triggers is if you have a device that you're going home on, that should be an automatic trigger. And I want to call for national guidelines that start to say that should be a trigger that that patient is identified. If you're going home on intral or parenteral nutrition, that should be a national standard guideline, whatever you want to call it, that just says this patient is a specific type of patient that needs to be treated in a specific way. And we're looking towards what does that look like and how do we get there um, so the patient's voices, and that's why Kelly talked about the strategic plan, advocacy, 
only decided we the voice we're going to be the voice to of and for patients and that's three different things how are we going to do that I don't think patients should own the whole bucket of rocks I don't think you should either I think we own them together that's the point is we have to talk to each other so over the last couple of days if you're an only member first of all if you're not an only member why are you not an only member it's free it's free so everybody gonna be an only member now right and you'll get some information from us um, clinicians patients everybody can be an only member and we say join us and you'll get information so we sent out a survey over the last couple of days so I have a PhD my minor is in statistics so I'm that nerd that sits there and three more came in I'm so yeah so I can tell you it's extremely exciting about what's coming in and we all, all we did was ask as a patient what stresses you out what stresses you out and we gave them a 10 and asked them to rank them you may or may not be surprised how they're ranking them and we asked the same questions for clinicians what stresses you out in dealing with patients with nutrition support and then we asked a follow-up question that says what do you guys think stresses out patients and we ask you guys to rank that. So if you have not filled out that, we'll ask you to please, please fill that out. Um, they don't, they're not matching up, as you can imagine. I'm not shocked. Are you guys shocked? I'm not shocked that they don't match up. So this is Manny, right? This is a reality of Manny's life. He's now 13, and he's been on nutrition support since basically, since infancy. And he will likely for life, unless somebody in here has some really great ideas on how to do idiopathic intestinal failure and who's not a transplant candidate. If, if so, talk to me. Otherwise, he's on TPN the rest of his life. But he wasn't supposed to make his first birthday, so that's actually pretty cool. But this is also his life. We go live. We live in Orland near Orlando, and we go to the beach, and we go to Disney, and we go to Alaskan cruise, and we go to Denver, and we go places because we want to live. And that's the thing is, is the, the heroes of the world, the Lynn Howards, the, there's some in this room that, that worked really hard to get patients out of hospitals into doing things like this, because that matters, right? And so when you see patients, a lot of times people think of them laying in an ICU bed like this, like that other picture, and not picturing like this. Um, we, we rode a roller coaster uh, just a couple weeks ago with a CPN bag. I mean, because, you know, that's what you do. So if I were to ask you uh, another survey that just says, you know, tell me about your life, you would probably do these things, oh, school, work, hobbies, you know, ADLs and all that kind of stuff. So I started to do that for Manny, and um, that was my chart. And if you notice, the little one for life is off in the corner because I actually honestly forgot that one. It was an afterthought to add that piece on there. I'm not even kidding, right? So like this is the life, and it is extremely complex. I don't think unless you've lived this world you really truly understand like it's complex from your end it is extremely complex from our end and all of these things over at, over uh, interact um, but here's the thing that I did not put on the chart is my worries and how close I am to drowning at all moments and if you look at a patient um, even on the good days we're one rock away from sinking our boat and we don't know what rock matters and which one's going to be life have life implications and which ones aren't a big deal. But at this moment, we don't know which important rocks are there. And it's 24-7, 365. I actually was on a board of a, a vascular access organization, a, a weird board call, and afterwards he said, I give everybody permission to not think about this for the weekend. And I thought, what, what a luxury you have, because that will never be my day. 24-7. In fact, you might be wondering who's taking care of my kid right now. I, I've built a support system. Because everything that we do comes with risk-benefit. And I think that it's overly emphasized like for surgical procedures. Like, that's, that's true. We need that. But there's a daily risk-benefit and alternatives that we go through. Every single day, every single rock that we have to measure what's next, what's important, what should be, what needs to be, and, and we don't know. So today, what you're going to hear following me is we deci I decided, like, what, what's one case scenario, and then let's talk about some different paths that, that people could choose. And so we chose short gut, short bowel syndrome, and they said, here's patients 
who have short bowel syndrome, and here's some different paths that they took. So one of them is GLP-2, one took transplant, one still on TPN, and just there's no right or wrong to some of these things, no one size fits all. And so that's what you're going to hear next is how did these patients navigate that same common decision and it went into some, some different territories. So thank you for coming today. Next is going to be Dr. Um, Kinberg is going to be talking, but before I bring her up, I want to tell one really quick story. And that is, um, the title was What Keeps Me Up at Night. Um, we don't even know what all rocks are important. The components of care is the term that we're using. What components are all there? And so we're calling on research. We're calling on, we need to figure out what components are there, which ones matter, what are the hierarchy, and so forth, right? I'm going to tell you, you probably saw a movie years ago, A Few Good Men, and there's a line in there that says, why do you hate them so much? And she goes, why, why do you like them so much? She goes, because they stand on a wall, and they say, nothing's going to hurt you, not tonight, not on my watch. That's what I call for you. Stand with us. It's a matter of life or death. Thanks. Uh, that was very inspirational. I'm sure you all feel the same way. I have some tears in my eyes just from listening to that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about GLP-2. Um, my first disclosure is that I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, so I'm going to be sharing the caregiver perspective, um, pretty much what I have learned from the, the families that I have been caring for. For about 15 years, I've been do, um, caring for children with short bowel syndrome. So I'm just going to start off with some background on GLP-2, which is one of the options for patients that have short bowel syndrome that are dependent on parental support. Um, so for those that are not familiar with GLP-2 or glucagon-like peptide 2, it is an intestinotrophic hormone that is produced by enteroendocrine um, L cells that are located in the distal ileum and proximal colon. And native GLP-2 increases intestinal blood flow. It increases the villus height and crypt depth, which facilitates nutrient absorption. And it also decreases gastric motility and secretion. Um, so tadouglutide or GATEX is a GLP-2 analog that was approved by the FDA for adult patients in 2012 and for children in 2019, and it's approved for anyone over the age of one that has short bowel syndrome and is dependent on parental support. So this is either um, on TPN, total parental nutrition, or intravenous fluids. And there have been several studies conducted in pediatric and adult patients that have shown that use of tadouglutide has resulted in a decreased volume of parental support, time off of parental support, so either less days per week or less hours per day or enteral autonomy, which is weaning off of parental support completely. Um, there are five main warnings and precautions associated with use of tadouglutide, and these include acceleration of neoplastic growth, intestinal obstruction, biliary and pancreatic disease, fluid imbalance and fluid overload, and increased absorption of concomitant oral medications. And there are some potential side effects, um, which are mostly abdominal pain and distension, nausea and vomiting, injection site reaction, and hypersensitivity. So when, when I'm talking to, to my patients and their families about use of GLP-2, I'm very transparent, and we talk about all of the potential risks as well as the potential benefits. So I'm just going to take a step back um, and look at how do patients and caregivers decide regarding treatment options. So one thing we have to realize is that every patient with short bowel syndrome is different. So there are different etiologies that resulted in short bowel syndrome. In kids, it's usually a condition that either they were born with, such as gastroschisis, or something that developed soon after birth that resulted in an intestinal resection, like necrotizing enterocolitis, or a twisting or volvulus of the intestine. Um, in older patients, it can be a complication of an underlying disease, such as severe Crohn's disease, or a complication from a surgery, like a GYN surgery, bariatric surgery, hernia repairs. So the, the, the ideologies are very different. Every patient is going to have a different journey different complications along the way. So there are some common ones, like line infections, um, line breaks, as, as Beth mentioned. Um, but these complications are different, and you never know when it's going to happen. So every patient is also going to have different goals of treatment. And these goals will change when the, when the child is born versus when they're three years old, when they're a teenager versus an adult. 
um, and they're going to be different outcomes. So we can't just look at all of these patients as one size fits all. And when we're making decisions regarding treatment of SBS, we have to realize that it's a multifactorial decision, and it's a team decision. It takes a village to care for these patients, um, and we have to remember to include the patients and the caregivers as part of this decision-making process. Make sure that we're educating them, make sure that we're um, sharing research findings with them, and there is a very big push now um, from the SBS community, from, from patients themselves and caregivers, to be more involved in, in the research that is being conducted and in, in the decisions that are being made. And when we're making these decisions, you know, in, in my example, starting GLP-2, we have to decide who are we going to start it on. So right now it's, only, it's approved for children and adults that have short bowel syndrome, so it's not for all intestinal failure. Um, intestinal failure meaning that you are dependent on parental support, but your bowel length is not actually short. It's, it's not functioning and you have malabsorption, um, but it's not short. So we have to decide who is an appropriate candidate. Does it make a difference if the patient had necrotizing enterocolitis that resulted versus gastroschisis versus a dysmotility? And, and what about the intestinal failure cohort of patients? What are we going to, st to start? What is the decision? Are we going to start them on GLP-2? Are we going to look at surgery as an option to, to fix potential stricture or dilated bowel? Are we going to talk about transplant? Um, are we happy with how things are and we don't want to rock the boat and just keep them on the current treatment? Or do we want to optimize medications, nutrition? Um, and again, these, these are not decisions that are made once. These are decisions that are continuously made throughout the journey, throughout every visit, throughout every discussion um, that we have with our patients and their families. When do we start GLP-2? So I mentioned it's approved at age one. So do we start it for everybody that has short bowel syndrome as soon as they hit that first birthday? Do we start it when we're not making progress, we need parental support? Do we start it when we have complications, when they're sick in the ICU with sepsis? When, when do we decide it? When is the right time? Why are we starting it? What are our goals of treatment? Are, is the goal to completely wean off parental support? That would be lovely, and I'm sure everybody would be happy with that, but that is not feasible for every patient. So if you have a patient that has had a massive resection and has only a couple of centimeters of small intestine, weaning off parental support is not feasible, but maybe we can achieve other outcomes. Maybe we can, just looking at TPN itself, maybe we can wean the volume, maybe we can get a couple of hours less on PN, cut a day, or other, other outcomes that are not looked at in clinical trials, but we see in real life, such as increased energy, improvement in the parents describing the, the, their whole family's quality of life with GLP-2. And when we're making these decisions, we also want to know, is a decision reversible? So if I start it and it doesn't work out or we have complications, can we take it back? Um, and what else is out there? What are the alternatives? And is this my only opportunity? So if I, as, as, as a physician, I'm talking to the patient about starting GATEX at this visit and the family says no, can we approach it again at another time? So I'm going to share a couple of cases um, and these are the ones that actually decided to use GLP-2. Um, not all of my patients have chosen to. I, I, I have not offered it to all of my patients. Again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are some patients that are doing really well. We're weaning off a of parental support, and they might not need it. Um, and there are, are some parents and patients that have decided not to use it for, for various reasons. So the first case I'm going to share is a five-year-old girl. She was born at 25 weeks of gestation, and she's a twin. And she has short bowel syndrome due to gastroschisis. She is very short, as you can see, so she was only left with three centimeters of jejunum, um, and it's anastomose to five centimeters of colon. From one and a half years of life until age four, she kept having recurrent episodes of GI bleeding, um, which is a complication that we're seeing more and more of. Um, so she kept coming into the hospital, severe bleeds, dropping her hemoglobin down to five, um, multiple endoscopies and colonoscopies that if I didn't know she had short bowel syndrome, um, I would think that she had Crohn's disease. So multiple bleeding ulcers throughout the small bowel, chronic inflammation. Um, so we treated her with various anti-inflammatory medications and then even went to, to medications for Crohn's disease, um, in this case, Intivio. She had severe oral aversion, feeding intolerance, so would vomit and panic anytime the mom tried to connect her feeding tube. So she was fully dependent on parental support. Um, we decided to, decided to start GATEX about a year ago and she has had a very dramatic outcome, so increased oral intake. She went from not tolerating any formula to now 12 ounces of formula, gained three kilos in the last year. Mom reports a really substantial increase in her quality of life, which again is not talked about in the clinical trials. She's not had any hospitalizations for GI bleeding in the last year. Um, and when you look at her actual PN order, so it's actually exactly the same as it was a year ago. 
So you might look at that objective data and say she's on the same volume, she's still on 12 hours, what did you actually accomplish? But if we look at the calories, we were able to cut down her calories from being 100% dependent on PN um, to now 66% of her calories coming from PN and the rest from oral intake and tube feeds. And the other thing that we have to think about in children, so we have a five-year-old girl here, usually we have to increase the calories as, as they are, are growing. We have to keep up with it. So not weaning um, the, the volume or, the cal or, or even if they stay on the same amount of calories might be progress in this case. Um, and I asked a couple of my patients kind of what their experience with, with Gatex has been like. Um, that is me. <laughs> we reversed the roles here, so she's playing doctor. Um, so mom reported that she, she first heard about Gatex three years ago. Um, when she started coming in for all of these GI bleeding episodes, and she stayed up all night during one of the episodes um, looking for answers, so really relying on the Facebook support groups, which a lot of our parents are part of. And then we made a decision together that we should give this a chance. Let's see if it helps with her inflammation. Let's see if we can make some progress. Um, and mom's goals were not to fully wean her off of PN, but maybe to cut down a little bit. And how has her experience with Gatex been? So the only con has been that she has gained weight. And mom says that's because she is less stressed. She has not been in the, in the hospital all of the time. Um, so the <laughs> patient has also gained weight. Um, and <laughs> her quality of life has changed substantially. And I think that's really important to, to pay attention to here. So she, her energy level is up. She's able to keep up with her twin sister. And she loves playing outside. And, um, and she, her advice would be just to take it day by day and to always to talk to your care team and trust your gut. Um, and these are pictures of her also living life. So she was just in Disney with her twin sister. You can see she's connected to PN, but that is not stopping her. Very, very briefly going to share two other cases. Super, super brief. So this is a four-year-old boy with short bowel syndrome due to volvulus. A little bit more bowel, so 20 centimeters of jejunum and ascending colon. And has been on Gatex just since December of this year. So again, mom reporting kind of, we knew it was time to try it. Um, goals of treatment are pretty simple. Um, to have him gain weight so we can get him off PN and try to help with his bowel movements. And she says the experience has been nothing but positive since we started. Within a few days, a huge increase in his interest in eating food um, and energy uh, again. And he wasn't low energy to begin with, but now even higher energy level in this four-year-old. Um, and she says that my biggest piece of advice is really just to, to give it a chance. And the last case I'm going to share is a seven-year-old, 31-week um, girl with, with shortcut secondary to neck. Um, more bowel in this case, so I was actually more optimistic starting her that we would be able to wean her off of parental support, and she was able to come off. Um, she had some bumps along the road, so it wasn't an immediate response. She had some admissions. She actually developed some other conditions. So after having to remember that th these real-world experience is not a clinical trial. And mom is very pleased she's able to tolerate more food, um, not having a central line has greatly increased their quality of life. They traveled to St. Lucia recently to go, to go meet um, the girl's grandparents. Um, and she, again, just saying, like, give it a chance um, and working together to, to try to get a better quality of life for these kids. And the last thing I'm going to share is just remembering to include the patients in this, even if it's a young child, just explaining to them that they're going to start this daily injection um, and how it might help them. So this is a video of one of my girls getting her attacks. <laughs> That's her twin, and then the one in the pink is, is my patient. What is it? What is it? Your medicine. I'm happy to introduce Emily, who is going to share her family's experience with transplant. Thank you. This is my son, Patrick. This is the picture that they sent to us when they asked us if we wanted to adopt him. And I will tell you that those eyes are just not fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He was born with short bowel syndrome. He had gastroschisis that was detected on an ultrasound, but when they repeated an ultrasound later, his intestine had disappeared. So at birth, he had six centimeters of duodenum and a descending colon. Um, there wasn't a lot that they could do at that point. They put him on TPN. 
placed a G-tube, created an ostomy because his colon was too narrow to consider an anastomosis at that point, um, transferred us back home to Utah where we live, and we brought him home. When we met with doctors to talk about bringing Patrick home and what that would mean for him, they told us that we were racing against three clocks in order to keep him alive. Those clocks included liver failure, infection, and central venous access. As long as we could keep the clocks running, he could have a full and happy life on TPN. But we didn't know how much time was on any of the clocks. And so it was important for us to find a way to not just slow down the clocks, but to find a way off of TPN for his long-term survival. Um, because Patrick had so little intestine, we knew that any attempts at adaptation, rehabilitation, were going to be slow and very difficult. And so we made the choice to take him for a transplant evaluation when he was young. He was four months old when we first did an evaluation um, and had him listed. We live in Utah, so that meant that we t went out of state. There is not an intestinal transplant program in Utah. Um, and then we kind of settled in for a long wait because we knew that his blood type was rare. A month after his transplant and, um, evaluation and listing, he started to have central line infections. First, he had a bacterial infection. The treatment for that um, changed the flora of his gut, and he ended up with a fungal infection. That fungal infection just wouldn't go away. And so eventually, it caused a cardiac arrest and a brain injury. Things didn't get better from there. Within his first year of life, he had had 10 central line infections. He had lost seven central lines. Um, and he was starting to have damage to his liver from constantly fighting infections and being on antibiotics. So we had to figure out a way to slow down the clocks. And ethanol locks at the time were an emerging therapy. I remember talking to the infectious disease doctor and we said, well, this would be really helpful, but Patrick needs TPN 24 hours a day. And we don't know how to do that. Finally, I proposed the idea that maybe we should place a double lumen central line so that we could put ethanol in one lumen, run TPN through the other, and trade every day. And that actually made a huge difference for him. We went from having monthly infections to two or three a year. With infections under control, we were able to focus on the next steps for him. Um, we took down his ostomy. We... Um, Tried enteral feeding. We didn't make a lot of progress with that. We did tapering procedures, and we did feeding therapy because we knew that someday we hoped that he'd be able to eat. Adaptation wasn't going terrifically smoothly. When we reconnected that duodenum that had been doing all the work to a microcolon, the surgeon said that it was like sewing a piece of bologna to a drinking straw. Um, it just didn't fit. And so motility was always an issue. Also, access was an ongoing problem. The double lumen line was stressful for his veins, and the ethanol locks were causing the lines to break. They were causing clots. Um, and he was having a lot of collateralization of his vessels. And by the time that he was four and a half, we were down to what we knew were the last couple of sites. And so we moved his transplant listing from the hospital that we had started to the University of Nebraska because we knew that they had an interventional radiology team that was capable of dealing with that lost access. Um, and it's a good thing we did because Patrick lost all of his access in the next couple of months. And he had to have an alternative central line place where they passed a needle through his femoral vein, through his heart, and out through his superior vena cava in order to restore access. We limped that line along, um, replaced it once, and amazingly, that held on for a little while. But that was the point at which we learned that if we lost central venous access, transplant wouldn't be an option. And we realized that we were really out of time. We met with our hospital's palliative care team. We made a plan for how we would withdraw care when he lost his access. But the line held on long enough, and Patrick received a transplant on his sixth birthday 
the um, organs here that are burgundy are the ones that he received, the liver, intestine, and pancreas. They also removed and resected a couple of other organs. It's not a small surgery. And from there, his recovery was really miraculously paced. He was off TPN in two and a half weeks. He was out of the hospital in six weeks. We went home at four months, and at his one-year appointment, we took him off of enteral nutrition. He was taking all of his nutrition by mouth. I wish I could go back in time and talk to myself when we were headed to transplant, because when I was on that plane flying to Nebraska, I cried the whole way. I was sure that I was destroying my son's life. We knew that he was doing okay on TPN. He was growing, he was happy, but the general feeling in the short bowel syndrome world is that transplant is too dangerous. People say you're trading one set of problems for another. They would say, have you considered a second opinion? Um, but for us, transplant has been absolutely transformative. It has made an, just a world of difference in the life that he's living. Um, he's 14. When we travel, we bring a case of food because we know that he's going to just need to eat continuously. He can down a pizza um, just all by himself, and he's really doing remarkably well, better than I ever imagined. We say that transplant needs to be a last resort, but the question is, how do you define last resort? Is last resort when a patient is already sick, malnourished, out of access? For us, if we had waited to that point, we would not have my son with us today. It took us five and a half years to find a donor for him. And so to have transplant as an option that we pursued alongside other options kept that door open so that when we reached a crisis point, we weren't too late to get started. Um, I know transplant isn't for everyone, and there are a lot of risks there are some very difficult outcomes. But if you could see my son, you would know that for him, it's been miraculous and it's worth considering for others. Um, our next speaker was going to be Shaylee Hunter. Unfortunately, she was admitted to the hospital right before this conference and she's not going to be able to be with us. So next we're going to hear from Lucas and he's going to address Shaylee was going to talk about TPN and the choice to stay on lifelong TPN. So Lucas is going to address that, um, as well as the effects of time on the decisions that we make. Thank you. Um, my name is Lucas. I have a story. Uh, as do we all, and I am uh, fortunate that mine can go on. Two years ago, uh, I didn't know anything, uh, frankly, about short bowel, uh, about transplant, about TPN. I didn't know what TPN stood for. Uh, frankly, I was afraid of needles. Uh, and so, uh, lots changed. Um, I did have uh, a background of growing up, moving around all over the world. I was from Brazil originally. Uh, but moved around, uh, had training in parachuting into new fields and consulting and learning, getting up to speed very quickly, uh, and you know, going out and finding leading experts and then going out and doing analysis and coming up with a strategy on, on what you should do. And that's, that's what I did for work. Uh, and I never imagined that that's uh, what I would have to do uh, for myself in, as if my life uh, quite literally depended on it. Long story short, there, is, there are no right answers, as you've heard before. And perspectives really do change over time. Uh, and if I can leave you with anything, it's that multidisciplinary multi care uh, and with a focus on the patient really matters. Uh, and before anything else, wanted to thank all of you uh, and wanted to thank especially all the caregivers in the room for all the work that you do. Uh, it really does matter. Uh, and it really makes a difference. So it's not something you can ever really prepare for. 
uh, but it is something that makes you realize that everything matters uh, until nothing does. Uh, in 2020, on uh, December 13th, uh, I was in a skiing accident in Salt Lake City, Utah. I had been a lifelong skier my whole life. Um, uncontrollable accident, binding came off when it shouldn't have, hit a pole doing 55 miles an hour, um, and long story short, ruptured the superior mesenteric artery uh, and leading to massive internal bleeding uh, that they didn't realize at the time. Was uh, in the ambulance as soon as possible. They did CPR twice en route to the hospital uh, and coded for 10 minutes as soon as, uh, about two minutes after I got to the hospital. My parents uh, were in Chicago at the time, uh, and they were greeted by a uh, policeman saying, your son's been in an accident and will probably not make it, but you should probably get to Utah as soon as possible. And so they did. Meanwhile, uh, I was in the care of the trauma teams at the University of Utah um, Hospital, and at first, priority was uh, st stabilize. Um, after coding for 10 minutes, lactate was at 16, pH was at 6.9, survivability was you know, under 1%. It didn't look good. Um, the priority at that point, my parents were already in the air, uh, and the priority was to just keep me alive until uh, they got there. And when they did, uh, they, uh, the doctors in Utah uh, said, the prognosis doesn't look good if he makes it, which is a very big if. Um, there will be lifelong consequences, and so what do you want us to do? At which point my dad said, how can you ask a parent to make that decision? And how can we be asked to let our son just die? There are certainly moral, ethical questions about it, and you know, certainly a tremendous amount of resources were used. But if not for that, I wouldn't be here today. And it was that decision to be maximally aggressive um, that truly saved my life. So uh, started turning the corner. They literally went through all the blood in the city of Salt Lake City. There was a phone call to the blood bank saying, we need more blood, and a response saying, you've used all of it. The last cooler is in the OR. That turned out to be just enough. <laughs> uh, and started turning the corner. At one point, um, still open, uh, had been left open for several days while they figure out what to do. Um, it did not look uh, good for the mid-gut. Uh, most of the bowel had already died out, and it was a question of what do we do. And uh, it was a fellow, actually, who in the back of the room mentioned, hey, I had heard in some Grand Rounds presentation a couple years ago there, was, uh, there might be a benefit to reconnecting. Uh, and so they, they looked into that. They spent 24 hours kind of putting feelers out. Uh, and it was um, Dr. Mangus at the University of Indiana who uh, went back, returned a phone call in the middle of the night saying, hey, yeah, that's probably what you guys should do. Uh, if you're able to, you should reconnect it. And so I was left with six inches of duodenum that was connected to the transverse colon. And frankly, um, that, that decision to reconnect has made a, an indescribable difference in quality of life, being able to eat and drink almost normally, uh, to the extent that I can't imagine what it would look like um, otherwise. And um, I think lessened for fellows and folks in the room, you know, if you have an idea, just say it. Can't hurt. And you never know, uh, you never know what, how important that will end up being. Uh, that first photo uh, was um, on December 19th, so the day after I woke up um, from a coma. Uh, and, you know, I think lesson that, uh, you know, be maximally aggressive as soon as possible and, you know, uh, relentless as soon as possible. But um, the day, two days after, I had a spinal fusion um, and um, recovery was more quick and complete than I could have ever imagined. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, that second photo was on Christmas. So you can see how uh, it was, you know, had a, a Starbucks downstairs. <laughs> uh, um, but also mid-COVID, so, uh, you know, visiting was, was tough. Um, and I think it, it, it really does put things in perspective on, uh, you know, everything matters. You can have a plan, uh, and, and yet 
everything can change. And it led to uh, a challenging road forward. Uh, just because uh, I had survived and had, you know, uh, had a quick you know, physical recovery, was walking again pretty uh, faster than anyone had imagined, I was out of the hospital in three weeks. One of those was in a coma. Um, and very quickly um, became apparent that a number of, uh, number of questions and, and path forwards uh, would remain. I went home with a port. I didn't know what one of those was. Uh, and um, TPN uh, management at home as well. Uh, and quickly the answer, the question became transplant or not. Um, and so within, within the first month, uh, actually visited, um, went to the University of Nebraska, and that was one of the hardest days, actually, uh, as uh, with Dr. Mercer, um, to be told that transplant is, is not this you know, magic bullet, uh, that there is no solution. Um, that was probably the hardest day. But he was right. And, and it took a long time for me to really, uh, to really come, to, come to terms with that. Um, but it's, I think, representative that, that mindsets and perspectives can, can really change. Um, right, after the, right after the accident, I was, um, it was not only a matter of adapting to TPN, adapting to new circumstances. It was, it was uh, relearning how to live with tubes and, and still recovering from a major trauma. Uh, and, and the inability to separate one from the other uh, and the inability to really see what life could be like in the long term um, has, a, has a huge, huge impact. Uh, and so the plan, uh, and then uh, immediately after, though, went uh, to a different center who said, no, we can transplant. And so um, went back to Dr. Mangus in uh, Indiana, who had followed uh, from the beginning uh, the, uh, the anatomy and um, with the plan that we'll list for transplant, but recognizing that there's no, uh, no immediate rush to do it. Um, the rest of the um, GI tract was in relatively good shape, uh, and, so, and so we'll just wait. Uh, but keep you on the list in case, uh, in case a perfect match comes up, uh, or in case the situation starts to deteriorate, uh, such that we would, uh, we would pursue that more aggressively. The second piece is having, uh, was having uh, establishing care at University of Chicago. Um, I live in Chicago. Um, and, and having that into, uh, multidisciplinary care team there uh, with dietitian, GI, pharmacists, nurses, managing everything from the actual TPN and the formula to the amount of calories to, uh, to the line, uh, what kind of line, um, you know, I had a week-long stay in the hospital because of dehydration as we were figuring out what formula was appropriate, had multiple line infections right off the beginning, uh, port got infected because it was being accessed every day, uh, had a Hickman that the skin reacted to, and so uh, multiple learning stages of learning um, at the time um, where it was all, uh, you know, in, in the first couple months, um, and, and, and I think it's hard to understate how that changes over time. As one problem uh, and one situation normalizes, others uh, become more important, right? And so, um, and having that team at UChicago that uh, coordinates both with uh, my home health, with the different transplant centers, uh, and with the different uh, practitioners at the University of Chicago um, has been has been critical, and I think is something that uh, having that multi multidisciplinary approach uh, across TPN management uh, is something that uh, can be tremendously impactful. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I think being your own advocate is something that cannot also be understated. That at the end, the patient themselves are really the only one who sees the full picture, uh, and so even when you're you know having discussions with uh, with doctors who. Um, you know, might prescribe antibiotics, reminding them that, hey, I have six inches of bowel, uh, by mouth is probably not going to work, uh, which is no fault of their own, uh, simply a function of uh, no one will have a better view of the whole image uh, than yourself. And so learning to stand up for that and learning to uh, be, you know, uh, uh, go out and find different experts. And I, at the beginning, it was uh, almost frustrating that I would go, you know, I said, um, well, how do we, how do we decide? Uh, well, just go to uh, all the experts and see what they say. 
well, that becomes tricky when one says you should do it, you should transplant immediately. And on the other side, you have folks who will tell you you should probably not transplant immediately for the number of reasons that, that you'll hear and that most of you know, yeah, whether that's complications with your kidney, your liver, uh, or your central lines. Uh, and you know, I think it's a, it's a trade-off between um, your, <laughs> it's a, easily a trade-off between when to do it uh, and you know, trading TPN for immunosuppression. Uh, in, in my case, I've been stable enough on TPN uh, and I'm now have gotten to the point of reconnecting with mentors, uh, going back to business school, uh, getting an MBA at the University of Chicago and normalizing and traveling, uh, getting back to playing soccer, getting back to skiing, uh, where it, it, it's become much more of a question of what are you actually optimizing for? And when you're optimizing for long-term outcomes, uh, and being very uh, honest with yourself about what are you actually solving for, what are you optimizing for, uh, that allows you to both to yourself and with your medical teams uh, to, to, to really be and have that conversation of what path and what treatment is most appropriate. Uh, and so for now, uh, I've been lucky enough to be able to go back to the University of Utah uh, and thank them all for keeping me alive uh, so that my story will go on. At the time, I was trauma daisy. Uh, you know, I was not. Uh, they didn't know my name. They didn't know my background. They didn't know anything, and yet had and received, you know, the utmost of care. Uh, without which, I wouldn't be here today. The path forward had left many questions, and the path, you know, from the beginning. If you had asked me the day after uh, the accident, I would have said, transplant as soon as possible, please. Uh, I need to go back to normal, mm -hmm. and now I'm much more at peace with, you know, uh, TPN for now. Continue monitoring uh, if, uh, if you know, the, the actual uh, kidney or liver or central lines uh, start to deteriorate, at which point we would change uh, how we go about it. Um, but I think that the initial frustration with there is no right answer has really, uh, has really you know, has made me realize that, and I think for us all to realize that um, it really does vary by, by patient, uh, and it really is a truly personal decision uh, and a conversation between uh, all the stakeholders involved. And so with that, uh, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Paul Wishmeyer. I'll leave it up there for the next person. That was beautiful. Really well done. So it is great to be with everyone in person again in a more meaningful way this year than ever before. And I think it's also great to be here today in particular for me because the cornerstone of the story I'm going to tell you to try to address this topic of when professionals disagree happened exactly a year ago, started exactly a year ago today which is, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but it, but it um, was, was not something I thought about much until this morning when I woke up. And I said, wow, it was a year ago today. So when professionals disagree, how many of you are dietitians in this room? Raise your hands. Ooh, almost everybody. So how many of you have tried to express your opinion to a physician or a medical team and had them say, raise your hand? Yeah. It's a challenge. It's a challenge, and, and don't give up. But, but I'm going to try to talk about some of the things that I think those of us that are patients and, in my case, physicians, try to do to change that mind and inspire that agreement from the people that know far less than you know or about nutrition, and they will never know as much as you know about nutrition. And so you need to remember that and you need to fight, but there's ways you need to do it. So again, this is the most common thing you probably hear on rounds every day, and, and we're going to talk about ways to maybe change that, and, and, and how we as professionals, I think, are inspired to be changed by the thoughts and, and, and impressions you give us. And for those of you that are patients in the rooms, your voice can be just as important, and, and, and I've always hoped that mine was as, as well. So for, the few, for some of you who may not know why I'm standing up here, um, in addition to, to, to the professional role I fear, uh, for, or I, I feel, um, I'm, a, I'm a patient too. This was me at age 15. 
um, actually at the University of Chicago, ironically. Um, I was diagnosed with IBD, um, was in the hospital about a year, was on TPN for about that same year, um, ultimately got about 60 units of blood over a couple of weeks. My colon perforated, I got septic, they took it out and um, told me that I would get an ileal pouch and be cured and now have no more problems. If only that was true. So um, unfortunately that's not true, right? What they don't tell you about is the obstructions and the adhesions and the complications with your stoma and the fact that the little pouches fail and then they have to take them out and 27 surgeries later, um, I'm about 140 centimeters of bowel and have been on TPN many times in my life. Thankfully I'm not now, although I take about 40 milligrams of little paramide a day to stay that way. So I'm hoping it will stay that way. But nonetheless, um, I wanna tell you about a few brief experiences to illustrate what happens when I as patient and professional, as well as my, my wife, who's also a professional uh, healthcare provider, disagree in what we do about it and how we get our point across. So this was me in 2014. So despite, like I think you're inspiring, Lucas, I mean it shows that you can be dead and come back and live. Never give up on your patients. I, I loved what you said. This was me in 2014, probably the best shape of my life with my son visiting my grandfather. Um, Life was good at this point. Unfortunately, I ate some quinoa a few days later. Never ever eat quinoa if you've had bowel surgery. Maybe never eat quinoa again, I don't know. Nonetheless, I got a bowel obstruction, ended up flying back from a wedding in Baltimore all the way to Colorado where I worked at the time because I didn't want anyone else to take care of me except for in a hospital I could control what happened. <laughs> okay, doctors and medical people are terrible patients, right? So came into my own emergency room, this was me, um, was seen by a first year surgical attending who I'd had as a resident for six years. Uh, Maria, she was wonderful, I'll never forget her face when she realized who it was. My lactate, <laughs> my lactate was 10, I was in shock. This is what happens when you fly, 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 knowing you're in trouble. Um, this is what we do as, pa as patients and, and medical professionals. And, and so they, she said, you've gotta go, you've gotta go to the OR. Um, and I said, can and you call Dr. Perlman, and he's this old time 40 year surgeon who'd operated on me before. I, I, I love you, Maria, but this isn't routine. So, so I, I came out of the OR after an eight hour surgery, got better. And, and the question then becomes when to start TPN? And, and I, of course, said, I think you need to start it now. And, and they said, well, you know, the Aspen guidelines and all, you're well nourished. We're going to wait seven days. I'm like, holy shit, no, you're not. <laughs> but, but I didn't win that one. I was too sick, I didn't say the right things, I didn't, I didn't prepare the right way, and we waited a week. I got no, I got no. And I ended up on TPN anyway, of course. I, mean, I know a little bit about TPN, I know a little bit about surgery patients. Um, and so ultimately, uh, didn't get what I needed though, and this is the other problem, you need to advocate for the kind of TPN products you get, and if you're in a hospital that still uses soy lipid, you, you better change that. That's something you can fix some disagreement about quickly. That's easy to get your hospital to change. And so I couldn't get the calories I needed. And, and then so a couple complications happened. Oh, no, undoubtedly because of some of the malnutrition that I probably experienced. I was losing weight rapidly. And I ended up with an incisional abscess. And I had two new attending physician surgeons on the service, both of whom I trained, both been out a year, who disagreed on what to do. And we chose Maria. I won't tell you who the other person was. She, she said, we're going to open it and we're going to put vac on it because he wanted to put a drain in. I said, I don't want plastic in there. It's going to get infected again. We weren't friends anymore, actually. We, it was hard to like, interact for the rest of my time with him. For my wife, the same. She worked with him as well. Sometimes you lose relationships, but you're the one that suffers the consequences, right? And your patients are too, so you need to fight for what's best for them. Relationships are important, but patients are more important. So again, we said no, and it changed that relationship, but I wouldn't do it differently. So again, remember, I looked like this coming in. I should have probably done pretty well, but I looked like this 17 days later. This is what delaying TPN does. I lost 20 kilos in 17 days on TPN and wasn't able to walk down the street without being short of breath afterwards, after a week. Couldn't pick up my own child five months later. I was too weak. He's not that big. He is now, but he wasn't then. So recovery was something that I needed to do actively for not a few weeks or a few months, but for a few years. It took two years of four to 5,000 calories, remember that number, to recover. I like to show pictures of me with my ostomy. I have a lot of patients at Duke who think they have an ostomy, their life is over. That's not true, of course. You can do anything with an ostomy that you could do before. There's nothing you couldn't do before that you can't do with one. I was surfing in this picture in Hawaii not long before this picture was taken. And I show, these, I show patients my ostomies all the time. 
There's a few of our dietitians here who have seen me do it um, from Duke. So unfortunately, this doesn't go away, right? February of 2022, this came back. And I was going through this again, having recurrent bowel obstruction after recurrent bowel obstruction. Happened for no apparent reason. I couldn't figure out what I was eating. It was adhered to my ureter. I was getting kidney obstructions now. And, and so I, I decided with our surgeon, Deb Sudan, who's a transplant surgeon, some of you might know her name, that I needed to have an elective surgery, which was terrifying. And so I thought, God, I'm going to go through this all over again. Can I do something different? Can I advocate for myself in a different way? And of course, you need to be ready before you go in. And as patients and caregivers, we need to prepare our patients before they have their operations and before they have their big events. So what did I do differently? Well, I figured out what I needed. This is last year at Aspen, by the way, this picture. I got my metabolic CART data. We did it, Jerome, who's sitting in the audience, did it for me too. That's my resting energy expenditure, by the way, at the bottom, 3,000. You can imagine what 25 kcals per kilo did nothing when I had surgery last time. And so I said to Deb Sudan, when should TPN start? Well, I'm going to have, have it started the day after surgery. And she said, that's not how I practice. And I respect Deb immensely. We care for patients all the time. She's one of the best surgeons in the world at what she does. But we sat in the clinic, and we did not agree. And so I said, I said what am I going to do to get this no to a yes, because I'm going to get this done differently. So what has the data said? I shared the data with her. I gave her the papers by hand and said, look, TPN is safe. I'm not going to get an infection. And it probably in surgical patients, this paper literally was published within weeks of me having surgery, leads to reduced infections in people who are having major surgeries. And, and Leslie, who's sitting here, actually has done data. And this is what you can do as dietitians. She's looked at our big surgery patients in our SICU and shown that they don't get fed for a week in our care. And so I wasn't going to get fed. And I wasn't going to go through what happened before. And so ultimately, I had that surgery. It was 13 hours long, lost 20 centimeters more bowel, which had my gallbladder taken was admitted to my own SICU, of course, was walking the next day. Rehab is important, Lucas, you are right. Um, and, and so TPN was started. So this time it was different. Actually, some of the people sitting, Leslie and others, wrote this TPN for me. They're sitting in the room. And unfortunately, I was doing well for the first two days, but at 2 a.m. on the third day, in the middle of the night, I woke up with a fever and a wet gown. And I looked down and stool was pouring from my incision. Pouring, pouring, and I'm septic, and I'm getting really sick and going into shock. And I ended up having two emergent surgeries to try to repair this. Deb couldn't fix it. She came back to me with the most terrifying thing I could have imagined she could have said, which is, you have a fistula that I don't know if I can fix. And I don't know if it can be fixed. So I'm going to put a drain in, and you're going to go on TPN maybe for a long time. And in fact, this is how sick I was. This was me a year ago this week, intubated in my own ICU where I work. Persistent GI fistula, again, is the most terrifying thing I could imagine. We all have seen the fistula patients, right? They stay sometimes for a year. Sometimes this fistula never closes. And now I thought, I'm really in trouble recovery-wise. How am I going to go back to my life? Am I going to see my kids grow up? Am I going to be able to participate in my children growing up? Am I going to have a life again? Well, again, remember, we did some things differently. Nutrition started early. People like Laura, sitting right there, measured my metabolic needs every few days. So we knew what I needed. Again, this is what I needed, and I was active. I walked and walked and walked. I needed 4,000 calories. How many of you write 4,000 calorie TPNs regularly? Especially for months. We did. This is what I got, and we changed the lipid. Now, it's a different lipid I'm getting, right? That matters to your patients. Again, if you're not doing that for your patients, now change, please. So I was discharged home. This is me at home on my TPN. Lipid choice matters. This is my dog, who's our coach, my coach dog. And that's my TPN in that bag right there. You can do anything. Lucas is right. TPN does not take your life away. And ultimately, I didn't have any LFTs. And I began to exercise. This is what patients need to do, and we need to convince them they can do. This was me exercising um, while I had my TPN and my fistula drain and all of my stuff. And ultimately, I only lost five kilos. I lost less than 10 pounds, that whole, the sickest I've ever been in my life. The whole time, and I was back to my pre-op weight within a month on TPN. And so eight weeks after that surgery, and I'm almost done, eight weeks after that surgery, I asked Deb, can I go back to competitively dancing with my wife? We have a competition in August, and I'm going to lift her over my head five times. She's not that big, but it's more than 10 pounds, because that's all she let me lift before that. And she said, do you think you can do it? And I said, I think I can. I think I'm just as strong. I don't think I lost any strength at all. And so sure enough, this was us, nine weeks after that ICU stay and those operations. Keep 
this is what advocating and for your patients and for yourself does. You heard about two hospitalizations, and I was much sicker than the second one. The first one, it took two years to recover. This one, it took two weeks. And so this is why you need to fight for your patients. And this is what it was worth. This was me that summer on TPN at the beach with my kids, with my parents, with my family, living life as Lucas does amazingly well. I'd never know, right? This is, this is what the difference is. So we have the, what will give our patients the best chance to recover? Who's going to be sure they get the right care and fight for them? You are. You guys are. You've got to bring data. You have to fight for what you know is right, and you have to never give up. This is your job to give your patients what they need when the doctors don't disagree with, when they don't agree with you. You need to fix that. And you need to turn that no into a yes. I want to encourage all of you, if you want to learn more, and if you have physicians that want to learn more, we've started a fellowship at Duke. A lot of people, some of the people in the room are speaking in it, and we're trying to educate more people around the world on how to be better caregivers in nutrition. And with that, I'll leave you with this. I encourage you to follow me on social media. I try to share lots of nutrition data and patient experience on those Instagram and Twitter websites, and I'm happy to provide data to you if you want to share that with your physicians. And, and we have people sitting in the audience who've helped people get metabolic carts and helped them change their lipids. Um, you have a lot of dietitians in this room that from Duke have changed practice around this country. And with that, I look forward to our next speaker, Maisie, who's going to tell us about how the patient experience can be put into practice. <laughs> I'm just going to bring this down a little bit. Uh, my name is Maisie Sear. I'm the manager of education and innovation for the Oli Foundation. Um, I am also a PN consumer myself, as well as uh, the sibling of another PN consumer. Um, you heard from many different folks during this talk, and regardless of what their journey looks like or the decision that they've made, I want to talk about how we can take these stories and continue to work towards a better system for your patients, for me, for my sister, for Lucas, for Paul. <laughs> my sister Mallory gave me permission to tell a little bit about her most recent hospital stay. Um, she wasn't able to speak today. She's got a frog in her throat, but she is here. Um, she and I have both been on TPN for about 30 years, which means we've also had central lines and managed our own care for about that long with the help of a huge support system. We were fortunate enough to grow up with parents, nurses, um, and like I said, that support system who always approached new challenges with a not if but how attitude. So we never let our diagnosis stop us. Both of our careers have allowed us to become fierce patient advocates where we get to speak both personally and professionally about our experiences. A few months ago, Mallory finally needed to have her line of about 15 years replaced due to an infection. She tried to be proactive and ensure she had a team of providers in place who knew what needed to be done in order for this to be a seamless procedure. But a breakdown in communication led to her going 11 days without TPN, um, someone who usually infuses seven nights a week, and having multiple unnecessary painful and expensive procedures done because of protocols in place and no one having a solid understanding of how to navigate those protocols when they don't fit the situation. While having a tunneled catheter is usually a last resort for patients, it's the norm for us, and no one in that hospital seemed to know the process for skipping the steps leading up to a central line placement. So Mallory had to endure a failed PICC line placement, a failed IJ placement, and other painful procedures. And Mallory is a fierce advocate and has spent most of her life working in and with the healthcare system and yet still managed to fall through the cracks when it came to her own care. How does this happen? We are a unique population of patients, many of whom have become intimately familiar with managing our own care, as Beth and, and multiple people have mentioned today, um, to the point where it becomes difficult, scary, and unprecedented sometimes when we cross the threshold to an inpatient setting, especially under the care of providers who are unfamiliar with our situations. When we are admitted to the hospital, which we inevitably will be at one time or another, we are already at our worst. We're dealing with whatever symptoms brought us there. We're frustrated from having to tell and retell our story over and over again to each new member of the team who walks in. And we are terrified that our life is in the hands of this new group of strangers. 
We don't fit into any of the boxes in which hospitals try to place their patients and have to place their patients. Protocols put in place to protect these patients often end up causing us more harm, um, especially for those with drastically different needs. As you've heard many times today, healthcare is not a one-size-fits-all approach, and continuing to treat it as such is causing unnecessary harm, trauma, and costing patients and hospitals time, energy, and funds. We understand that there are protocols and policies in place that providers are taught to follow. There's red, there's red tape in place to keep everyone safe, and we get that. But what happens when that red tape is what's putting us in danger? My nose runs when I get nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so how can we fix this? Um, my ask for you today, as again, you've heard from multiple speakers, is to always prioritize the patient perspective, and not when we're on stage with a microphone in a nice dress and heels, but also when we are a crumpled heap in a hospital bed hooked up to tubes and wires and barely able to form a sentence. Our perspective matters then too. We understand that there are policies providers have to follow, but we're trying to understand what we need to do when those policies are actively putting our health at risk. Whether it be a care plan, a checklist, a contract, we need to figure out a way to streamline the circumnavigation of these perfunctory protocols when they don't fit the patient. We need your help to figure out what pieces of our care you can pick up, what rocks out of those wheelbarrow you can take, or maybe you know best who the key players are and can help communicate what we need to them. Helping and connect us to resources and education when necessary, helping us figure out when we're bumping up against that red tape and how to navigate a way around it. You are the experts of the system. We are the experts of our bodies. Patients who are reliant on nutrition support have a multitude of complex needs that require a comprehensive team who's willing to work with them to help meet those needs. This is a very simple visual that only begins to encompass like what Beth showed for Manny. Um, and you can see, you know, hobbies, relationships, travel. Those are the little guys in the corner, but they need to be priorities too. As Beth mentioned, if everyone on the team is willing to take one rock out of that wheelbarrow, the load becomes a lot lighter. The key to this is consistency and communication, making sure the patient knows who is responsible for what and making sure each team member follows through. Consistently reevaluating the patient's need and updating the members of the team to ensure everyone remains on the same page. This includes when the patient is admitted and discharged home uh, from the hospital, whether they're going home on nutrition support for the first time, heading home with a new device, or admitted for a routine procedure. If we aren't allowed to manage our own devices in the hospital, we, at the very least, need to be confident in the abilities of the people who are. The number of times I have seen a nurse drag a tubing across my bed and then try to hook me up to it would make you cringe, and should make you cringe. When we are admitted to the hospital, we should be able to rest and recuperate, but more often than not, we are exhausted from voraciously advocating for what we need so we don't get sicker, staying vigilant so we don't end up with another or a worse infection, or explaining to the 15th person why we're on TPN in the first place. It's in the chart. Read the chart. Um, <laughs> we are doing all that we can, but we need support. Let's stop trying to fit square pegs into round holes and start making it make sense. So how can you help? What rocks can you carry? You know how to navigate the system, or at least who the key players are, or what your role is within it. You can help advocate for us when we can't advocate for ourselves. You can help us know what we don't know. We may be the ace up your sleeve, but you are the ace up ours, and we can't make meaningful change alone. As Beth mentioned, we love data, um, and so that QR code will take you to the survey for clinicians and providers about what stresses you out, because we are in this together. So we want to help you help us, and that is how you can do that. Um, we are at booth 221. You can take our survey there, too, or come give us any feedback or ask questions. Um, and with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Dr. David Mercer um, to talk about where we go from here. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So see that picture? That, that picture is an example of catfishing. Just in case you don't know what that term is, that's an old picture. So you can, you can choose to swipe right or swipe left. It's whatever you, whatever you, hopefully, 
Hopefully by the end you'll swipe right. I think right is the good way, right? I'm, I'm not on Tinder, so. So I often don't make up my, the exact words of my talks until I get to the talk. And um, you know, they're usually things that I talk about all the time. So I'm talking about managing fistulas or managing short bowel or microbiome or lipids or something like that. But today I had no idea what the talk was because they just said, oh, just go at the end and kind of wrap it up. So, so I was just furiously scribbling all kinds of shit down here about what I was going to talk about. And then I, so I've made like about three talks in the last 80 minutes and then I'm like, no, nah, that's stupid. And I threw that away. And so we have about six minutes or something. So FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, be sincere, be brief, and then be seated. So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to just hit on a few points. So it's, I, I've been to a lot of different meetings and I've seen a lots of different kinds of symposia and stuff, but I've never been in this exact format the way this was done today. And I don't think anybody else probably has, I would think, right? Because I've been to just about every meeting in the last decade, and I'm pretty sure we've never done anything like this. So what you saw was these evocative talks, you know, where you're like in tears, you know, as you, as you, and, and, and I've been fortunate enough to have my own life path cross in and out of some of the different talks. And so, so I'm sitting there, you know, scribbling and going, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, it's so moving hearing it all. But what were my takeaways? So my takeaways were, there's many paths, isn't there? So we, we saw a, a gifted group of speakers tell us about their stories, and they all had different paths. And, and everybody sort of achieved this meaningful, positive outlook and this way to sort of achieve the goals that they want to achieve. So, you know, Emily talked about it very, very clearly that you know, you have to make difficult decisions and you don't know if the decision you're making is necessarily the right decision for you or not. And you have to choose. I mean, you know, we talked about the same thing when you were talking, right? Lucas was talking about you take, you take sometimes difficult options and you try to choose between, you know, difficult and more difficult as to what your path is going to be. But there's many paths to get where we need to be. And in the end, we actually seem to do pretty good for a lot of patients. One of the things that's really changed for me in my career is choosing goals. It's choosing, you know, when, when I started this, when, you, when you're young, when you're young at anything in life, but certainly as a young physician, you tend to see things in black and white. We must do this. Like we, we must cut TPN. We must be on tube feeds. The, the, you know, this is the way we do things. And, 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 and what I've come to learn over the course of my career is everything is gray. Nothing's black and white. Everything is gray. And, and that, that's not a bad thing. It's okay to be gray. It's okay to be another quote that I often use of my team. I have the greatest team in the world, by the way. Um, love my team, and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. But we talk about, you know, Bruce Lee, the martial artist. Bruce Lee talked about the idea of being like water, that water can conform to whatever, whatever container it's in, and it can move around any obstacle. And if you leave it long enough, it can erode any surface, and it can always achieve what it wants to achieve. And so this idea that, that there's many different pathways to get to where you want to go, and being like water means you don't be dogmatic about any one thing. You think about what are the different ways that we can get to what we want to do. So I thought that was one of the really um, meaningful things that I heard. Now, a thing that, um, this is where I'm going to come in to talk about my own team. One of the things that we heard a lot about, which is unfortunate, is it's not always very smooth, is it? You know, so, you know, and we heard that from a whole bunch of speakers, that Teams can come together and can do a really good kick-ass job, but, but it doesn't always work that way. And sometimes you do feel like you're alone and you're on a limb, you're on a cliff edge by yourself. And so for those of us in the room that are clinicians, I think it behooves us to try to figure out what are we doing wrong? And, and I would put to you that it, it's not so much that we're doing anything wrong as individuals. And I think Beth kind of touched on this. Like It's not any one person doing something wrong, but systematically it's not right. So we know when something is right, right? We're sitting in clinic. Again, I know there's all kinds of different clinicians, but you're sitting in clinic and you go, we should be able to get this tube feed. Why is this so stupid? You know, like, why, why, are we, why do we have to call? In? Why is someone saying, if I move you to three days of TPN, I can't get that paid for anymore? Like, you know, I mean, these are stupid things. We know they're stupid. Everybody, you, we can recognize when they're dumb, right? But yet we have to do them. We were talking about jumping through hoops, Lucas, right? We were talking about the way we all play games. And we all know they're games. We know it is. We, the payers know it's a game. The pharma knows it's a game. We know it's a game, but we all play the game because we're compelled to play the game because we have no other option. This drives me nuts. So one of the things that I'm doing in Oli 
is I'm t taking over advocacy. And so I'm gonna make a sort of a play for advocacy to say, if you have the time during this meeting or if you come to our OLE conference in St. Louis, what I wanna hear from everybody is what do we do to change this? How do, you know, how do we, because I'll do what I can. This is how I wanna end my career. I wanna end my career as an advocate, figuring out how we change the system for everybody. So what I need to know from all the members and from all the clinical community is what do we do? Ultimately, what I've come to realize a lot in this field is the patients, so we have a small field, right? In this room, we have pharma, we have clinicians, we have patients, we have all different kinds of clinicians, and we're all together in one room. You're not gonna see this in a lot of disease states. Our patients drive the field forward more than in almost any other disease. Emily talked about how she advocated for having the dual lumen line and putting ethanol locks because her doctors didn't come up with that, but she did. We do blenderized feeds for patients. We didn't come up with blenderized feeds, nor did industry parents came up with blenderized feeds. People said, oh, look, we're blenderizing this stuff and giving it to our kids. So then everybody goes, oh, we can make a buck off that. Let's make blenderized feeds and put it in a fancy package, right? You can make it yourself for pennies on the dollar, but, but somebody makes a profit off of it. So that's patient driving change. Where do I see this changing as we go forward? So one of the things that we're doing, and I see Marie, who's one of my colleagues here, we're trying to do projects where I don't want to tell the community what we should be studying. I want the community to say, this is what we need and this is what we should study. And we can actually do that. So we're doing projects that are done in the community by patients. All we do is provide a very rough framework for the research, but it's done by patients, conducted by patients, and the data is analyzed by patients, and then the information goes back to the community. And I think that that's one of the paths forward. I think that it's not up to me to tell you what your quality of life is. It's not up to me to tell you what your goals are. It's up for you to tell me how you want your life to be. What do you want to do? You want to, you want to be an MBA? You want to have that kind of shredded body? You want to do these? You know, you, you, want, to be, you want to be hot? Well, let me know. Because we can give you 4,000 calories a day if that's what you need for guns like that, you know? If that's what it takes, we'll make it happen. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I think that it's really critical that the fact that we're all together in one room shows that what we should be doing is we should all be partnering together. And we should never be in a, in a, in a situation where it's patients versus clinicians or that pharma has to be at arm's length from doctors. You know, we can't do that. That's stupid in our field. We develop together, we co-evolve, and we do better if we all work together. I would also make a push. I, I'm, I'm going to wrap up in about 10 seconds, but just to say, we talked about who do, how do we train people to do this better. So I think that's important. I think training people is important. But when the question was raised of how many dietitians are there in the room, and you saw like 60% of the hands go up in the room. So I think training physicians is fine. You know, I am one. It's, it's OK. But really, what you should train is dietitians, because that's the people who actually genuinely impact on how things work in your, in your hospital. So if you really want to make a big impact, what you have is a team of dietitians who are really, really invested in this, who learn how to do intestinal failure and learn how to do TPN. I think that's the path forward. And I think one of the things we're going to work on in Nebraska is trying to develop a, a dedicated um, fellowship for dietitians to do intestinal failure, because I think that's a better path forward than training a bunch of doctors who probably won't do it ultimately. <laughs> so in conclusion, thank you all for coming for what I think was a very meaningful symposium for me. I think it really taught me a lot. And I have pages worth of notes. Anybody who wants to get a hold of me afterwards or at any time during the meeting or come to, our, to come to our conference in St. Louis, please let me know what it is that you want to do and what we can do to help. Because I think Oli is really looking to transform ourselves in the next 40 years and to really be something different maybe from what we've been previously. And I hope that we can really be a strong voice advocating for all of us together. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>